This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast, Chris Graham, joined by Scott German. And first time in a while, Scott and I have gotten together talking some UVA sports. And we're going to do so on the eve of the implosion demolition of University Hall. So this will be a special University Hall edition of our podcast. And we'll share some memories, thoughts, and etc. Uh, from all of our years covering games, going to games as fans at U-Haul, and I guess kind of looking back now. And so, Scott, your first thoughts as we head into this, so we're recording this on Friday, the day before uh, the, the uh, implosion of University Hall. Uh, your thoughts as, uh, you know, the last hours of University Hall countdown uh, a- about, uh, you know, what uh, that building meant to you, to UVA basketball, whatever the case may be. I don't know where to start because it meant so much to me because it seems like I, my earliest memories of things that I did with uh, my dad uh, around sports centered around him taking me to U-Haul as a seven or eight year old uh, during the inaugural season back, I think it's 65, uh, watching some some bad basketball team and not even knowing it as an eight or nine year old, it's too excited to um, to be in an arena such as that to, to really grasp whether you were watching a good team or a bad team. You were watching college basketball. That's all that mattered. Then as I got older, to, to appreciate um, some of the really good teams, the great players that came came to Virginia, starting with Park Hill, um, Walker. Samson, uh, Stiff, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, just a lot of great memories. Uh, people that I've met that became lifelong friends that some are not with us anymore. Buck Bingler, uh, named by, a man by the name of Charlie Smith, who, who was the original public address announcer uh, at University Hall. I thought he had to prevent his voice uh, and was a young man awed by being able to meet him and get friends with him until uh, his later life, which passed away relatively early in about that. Uh, some of the event staff people that were there that did such great pride in being uh, a member of the staff, one of which was my father. Um, and then watching the great Brown Sampson play there and the, and the Monumental college basketball games took place between Ralph and Michael Jordan, Ralph and uh, Williams, Clark Kellogg, Ohio State. The list goes on and on and on. It just, it just doesn't stop. So it's a, it's a bittersweet day. Um, that day, the last day that it's going to be standing. It's been a lot of people that don't typically think great buildings are aesthetically, but I, the good time call, the I'm a little disappointed that the university couldn't have found a way to keep it, uh, keep it in function like 50 days. Yep. Um, uh, I think it was, uh, Reynolds Coliseum, uh, Carolina kept Carmichael Auditorium. Uh, they still utilize the West Peak Brick or still, still playing in the pool. So, sad that they couldn't found, have found a way to keep it, um, useful, but, uh, they did, and now it's got a better, got a better back to field, the football, and other sports. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sad day, but, but it's, a, you know, it's kind of a turning point within your cap letting you see what's going to happen, what's going to rise from it. I'll, uh, I'll give a couple of thoughts on, on that part of the, uh, the story, you know, about the, you know, the sad part about UVA not being able to find a, a way to, to, to you know, utilize University Hall. Like you mentioned, Carl Michael Auditorium, uh, the Reynolds Coliseum uh, at UNC, at UNC State. You know, when, when I was working on the book with Patrick Height, Mad About You, Four Decades of Basketball at University Hall, and that was back in 2006. So we started working on the book in 2005. We knew then, uh, and in fact, we devoted part of one of the chapters of that book to the fact that UVA was already talking then. That was, you know, 13, 14 years ago. About hey, U Hall is not going to stand after after we get done with paying for for John Paul Jones Arena, 
uh, we're we're going to do something with that that space that's that's going to lead to the demolition of University Hall. It just took it took a few years longer to get there uh, than they thought at the time, and they thought at the time it would take a while. Uh, you know, JPJ for a comparison cost 130 million dollars in 2006 to construct. And that's about $190 million, uh, depending on how you do the inflation, today's dollars. This project that includes the demolition of University Hall and then the construction of the grass practice fields, the strength facility, the, the sports medicine facility, is going to be probably, when you, know, when you add up the $10 million for the demolition plus $180 million, it's going to be about the same as JPJ. So when you put that in context, you know, that beautiful building we got across the street from you all, JPJ, uh, cost about the same as what we're getting ready to do, what, what this demolition is going to start doing. So now going back to the, you know, U-Haul, uh, and, and, you know, yeah, over time we decided that it wasn't the best building in the world. Ted Jeffries called it the pregnant clam. Uh, there was uh, uh, talk about uh, how it was hurting recruiting, dating back to the J.R. Reed recruitment you know, when U-Haul opened, though, in 1965, it was considered a state-of-the-art arena. Uh, and so that put that in mind when we're, we're thinking 30, 40 years from now and we're getting ready to replace JPJ and what a dump JPJ might be in 30 or 40 years. Because U-Haul, the, the, the process to build U-Haul started in 1960. It opened in 1965, but the university hired a um, uh, a, a, a well-known Italian architect, Pierre Louis. Luigi Nervi, how, I've, I've never had to say those words out loud, but I wrote, when we wrote the book, we did the research on this. I interviewed Richard Guy Wilson, architecture professor, architectural historian at UVA, still alive, you know, guy who, who on grounds you go to when you ask questions about uh, architecture on, on, on the UVA grounds. And he talked about how that Nervi had based the design of University Hall on the major central building for the Summer Olympics in Rome in 1960, those famed Rome 1960 Summer Olympics. And so when you all opened in 65, again, it was something that was looked at across the country as, hey, this is a this is a marvel, ar architectural marvel. And so, you know, and we think about what it replaced Mem Jim, uh, UVA alums, you know, people have gone. Uh, my 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 uh, department's graduation was a Memorial Gymnasium. Uh, I played a lot of pickup basketball at Memorial Gymnasium. It, 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 and uh, there's still events there, wrestling, volleyball. There, there's still events there that, that UV Athletics hosts. But it just blows my mind that that used to be the, the ACC basketball arena for, for UVA. And so U-Haul was a big, you know, big growth uh, opportunity for UVA. It, 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 we could fit as many as ten or 11,000 people uh, at one time until hot dog night anyway. Uh, and hot dog night – which we can talk about a little later on, uh, but you know, which was a huge, huge growth from the 2000 we could fit into Mem Gym. So it was a huge deal for UVA to get this this arena. And when it opened in the mid 60s, the football program was starting to get a little better. The basketball program was starting to get a little better, you know. And it really, it really set the tone for you know the University of Virginia taking athletics more seriously than it had up to that point. And so. You know, it, it in the history of UV athletics, it was something that was it, it filled the need. It, it it you know really allowed UVA to grow athletically. Uh, but yeah, it you know yeah we may have determined later on that it was not what we wanted it to be. And JPJ is very much next level from what U Hall was. But boy, U Hall was next level from what Mem Jim was. So you know, I, I wanted to say all that to kind of put it in context for people who who maybe especially the younger UVA fans, younger UVA alums who maybe don't remember much at all about University Hall. Uh, and if, if you do have memories, you remember that was kind of aging when you went to games there. Boy, in its heyday, it was the place to be. And so I, I kind of want people to remember that too. Oh, it was. And it was it was a, the home court advantage that University Hall had was just amazing. And before, not as just what when Ralph was there, but even after Ralph, before Ralph, the, post, the, the noise level in that building was just uh, tremendous. I remember one night after a game of the state, uh, the late uh, Jim Balbetta was serious, complaining that that Ocean should come in and check the decibel work in, in the building because he knew it wouldn't be safe. Uh, because it was. It was, it was so loud that at times it was quiet. 
quiet. It was so loud that it, it, it just the, the death pool went crazy. All start. I can think of a couple of instances around uh, rebounds of this shot against Merrill in the last game in Ralph's career. Uh, the, the thunder is dumb that Ralph had over Michael Jordan. I mean, this numerous times that the noise level was just off the chart. You know, the interesting thing about you all, so an architectural standpoint, uh, and I, I got this from a long-time UVA boy. Uh, if you consider 81 years being a long-time piece boy by one puppet, uh, which most of them were, uh, had that record. He said that he had talked to the one of the original architects of, of, of JP Day, and they said, or, excuse me, if you all, that the, the banker wall of University of Texas, you think very well that it was what it was, was that when it was built, it was built so that there was really no practical way to ever expand. And that that was the one feature that before anything was off on the boards regarding what you could take that would be understood to the design of the JP Day that it had to be a building that at some point is the future to expand it on. Um, and at the time, no one ever thought that would be a problem at University College because they believed in Memorial Day, a building that seated only 2,000, that they rarely built. They rarely built that building unless they were playing a really named opponent like North Carolina with, with uh, Billy Cunningham and the uh, famous Alba Clark. Uh, so the thought that there would ever be a building uh, bigger than University Hall with all the problems that they turned up after one of the main drawbacks that that was 8,500 uh, feet in the revenue uh, of the Kenyan to really compete with some of the other big boys. Because this is your arm break to get see the game of Carolina left Carmichael on a board with Peter uh yeah. It wasn't twenty three thousand so be yeah, Smith Center. And then the same with in state when they left Reynolds Coliseum with Steve about yeah, to go to the uh the in center uh which seat about twenty. So they weren't able to keep up with that arm break and uh, there was no way to expand the ball. So good to know that down the road if we need well, I mean, I would say I don't know that you expand anymore, though. Uh, you, and I, I went over the history of this uh, when we were working on our book, and then I've revisited some of that in the last week. You think about it. You, you talked, Scott, about those two examples, NC State and North Carolina. They both just built new arenas. They didn't expand either. They just built new arenas. And so in this day and age, you don't really expand on a current arena. Uh, and, and UVA learned that lesson as well with U Hall, uh, as you mentioned, it, it was hard to expand. Uh, in the late '80s, there was uh, a study done. Uh, it was determined that it would cost about forty million dollars to add a thousand seats, which just wasn't economically feasible. Uh, when Terry Holland, the former basketball coach, became the AD in the late '90s, there was a, a study done uh, to look at options for maybe dropping the floor. Basically, you know, when you walk into JPJ now, you walk in street level. The floor is, is, is below the ground, and, and so there was talk about trying to do that at U-Haul, and that proved to be economically unfeasible as well. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you built – that you – you know, they're, there's, they're never going to add seats to JPJ. They'll just, you know, eventually replace JPJ too. That's just what happens. Uh, hopefully not sooner than like when you see like in, in big cities, the Georgia Dome has already been imploded. Uh, the Atlanta Braves played baseball, the 1996 Olympic Stadium, that's already gone. Uh, it, it's hard to fathom that. I mean, the Charlotte Coliseum was replaced in the late 80s, and then they they replaced it. Uh, it, it I, that I can't fathom, you know, a 20 year lifespan or even a 25, 30 year lifespan for an arena anymore. U Haul lasted 40 years. It, it served its purpose, and then you build something new. But it is interesting, though. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I think you hit that point. When we were writing the book, Scott, you hit that point so well. Going from Mim Jim at 2000 to University Hall, 8 or 9 or 10, depending on the day, uh, nobody thought that you would ever need a bigger arena because UVA sports were 
an afterthought. I mean, we look at it now. We're on the heels of a national championship in basketball. Uh, as we're talking today, you're seeing preseason football magazines talking about UVA being the favorite in the Coastal Division uh, in, in the ACC football race, which has them playing in Charlotte, which has them competing for a, uh, you know, one of those New Year's Day games. Uh, back in the 60s, that was not at all the, th- the thought. The football team had one year in the 60s where they went 5-5, five and five and they practically threw a parade for that team. Uh, the basketball team uh, was was very much a second division team in the ACC, which was only seven or you know depending on the year, seven or eight teams back in the 60s. So no, no the the problem wasn't will this arena ever uh, will we ever need to put more seats in? It was how are we going to put 8,000 people in there because there aren't that many people. And, and, and in that context, Scott, you've told a story, and in fact, I'll, I'll, this will be a sneak preview. Uh, the, our book, Team of Destiny, that we're all working on, Jerry Ratcliffe and I and you and Scott Ratcliffe and Zach Peerless, uh, it'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. We all we got, we wrote the whole story of the season. We did feature stories on the players, but we also shared some personal essays. I loved one of your stories, Scott, about how your dad used to carry you into games. Tell that story because it really tells a story about those early years of UVA basketball. Yeah, without giving too much of our book away, um, we'll be sharing some of the yeah, we'll share some of our personal memories. I remember my dad taking me to all those young, young man. Um, the arena opened in '65. I was born in 1967, so I was eight years old. And uh, when we got to the uh, to the arena, to the, uh, to the main gate, um, he would pick me up and carry me in. And hey, Scott, I think we're losing you here. Uh, Scott's in travel. Uh, Is it? Oh, there, there I'm you sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I got you now. Um, I was eight years old. I was old enough to walk from the car to the arena entrance, and then he would reach down and pick me up and carry me in. And I always wondered exactly why he did that, uh, because I was an eight-year-old, or a pretty big eight-year-old, too, at the time. Um, then I later learned, well, that's simple, because in the early days, they were so desperate to get people into the arena, they allowed adults uh, to bring their children in arms that children brought in, carried in, were admitted free. So my dad never once tried to find a way to get a bargain, but just pick me up like a sack of potatoes, throw me over his shoulder, and carry me into the arena. <laughs> and then immediately, once past the turnstile, uh, basically put me down and say, "Okay, you're on your own." And literally, even if you walk around the building for the, the circle, couldn't get lost. And um, you know, those are they, they, the opening night. I did some research. I uh, actually found the article. The opening game against Kentucky, uh, they were able to, to to attract the Kentucky Wildcats, which at the time was, depending upon the one of the two polls, one the nature and number two, just by legendary Adolph Rupp. Kentucky was the inaugural opponent in the University Hall. And... Uh, but, uh, like Arizona would be a novel opponent in Dayton, Dayton. Um, That game against uh, Virginia was was not close to being a sellout. It was a little over 6,000. For the opening opening game of the building, um, if you look back to J.P. Day in 2006, the game against Arizona, not only was it a complete sellout, I mean, tickets were just being scouted for ridiculous price down front. Um, to get into that game. So, you know, it, the early days of basketball in U Hall, those, those those folks that were against spending such an amount of money to build a bigger arena were just basking in glory because there were nights that we would go to games and I dare say there was more than 2,500 people in a day. And, um, uh, you know, it, it took Four or five years, I think it really took the arrival of Barry Park Hill, um, good support player that Park Hill had around him, who 
build that momentum up to a, to the level of what you know we still have today. And of course, the famous uh, win over South Carolina, I think South Carolina was four for fifth today. Been struggling to be above five hundred at the time. Mark Mary Clark still hit a big line number. Was about three seconds uh, <laughs> South Carolina. That kind of turned the light switch on for good. But I think the rest of the year they had near catastrophe crowd. And it was actually a ticket that you had to look, you had to plan ahead. You had to call, or you had to go and get tickets in advance. But you didn't want to take a chance on not getting a ticket. Yeah, that year, uh, you know, I, I don't have these records in front of me. That, and I, ha- I do have our, our uh, a snippet of our story from Matt about you. Uh, Carolina, uh, South Carolina was ranked second. And South Carolina was still back in the ACC for our listeners out there who, who don't remember or didn't know. South Carolina was still in the ACC back in the early 70s. It was a 1971 game. But Virginia had a 21 season. Bill Gibson was still the coach at UVA. Uh, it had a 20-win season, of course. Back then, 20-win seasons didn't guarantee you anything, even an NIT bid. And at that UVA team, I think, finished 21-9, and nine, but didn't didn't get, didn't get do anything else. Uh, Terry Holland comes in in 74, and uh, uh, by 76, he has that Miracle and Landover team that goes, you know, wins the ACC tournament championship and uh, goes to the, to the uh, NCAA tournament. A lot of folks forget that the 77 team, and that's, the Miracle and Landover team was sixth place in the ACC out of eight teams going into that tournament. They had to beat the three two and one seeds. Uh, you know, a team with uh, a, a, a under 500 record going to the NCAA tournament. The next year's team actually had a similar issue. They had a talented team, but a lot of injuries, and, and so as a result, under 500. Got to the final, played Carolina in 77, and lost in overtime in the ACC tournament. So, uh, Things were on the upswing, you know, recruit Jeff Lamp, Lee Raker, eventually Ralph Sampson. You have the 80s run. And uh, I have to ask you, Scott, as someone, I was still in elementary school and, and I was not fortunate enough to be able to go to any games until I was a student at UV, actually, in the early 1990s. I never got to go to any games at U-Haul. I have to ask what the environment was like in the Ralph Sampson years. Uh, I can guess a little bit because the last few years in JPJ, obviously, with the team, you, you go to a game expecting to win. The Ralph years, UVA, in, in, in games played in U-Haul, in those four years, UVA was 49-2 and two in his, in his uh, four years. Uh, you, um, you, you were certain when you got in the car to go to a game in U-Haul that UVA was going to win in the Ralph years. You just kind of had to wonder how they were going to do it this time. What was that like? And with the best player in the country, the best player that anybody ever seen, three-time National Player of the Year, there have been three of those guys, Bill Walton, Ralph Sampson, Lou Alcindor, in NCAA history, there won't be any more because you'll be a one-and-done kid if, you, if you're a National Player of the Year once in this day and age. What was it like in those Ralph years being in University Hall? Wow, well, it's, you know, it's, just, it's almost impossible to, to really tell you that because to relate to it today, it's, just, uh, it's not a, it's just not an apple to apples comparison. But first of all, you know, you got to start with this. There was no social media. Uh, there was no message board. There was no ESPN. Or if there was, it was the entity of the ESPN. So there wasn't the, the, the national television audience that was there every night. I remember a few games and it was, they weren't even televised. Um, but you knew that there was something special going on because there was a huge media contention there every game. It didn't matter if we were playing uh, North Carolina, Maryland, and Duke at the time was not the powerhouse that they are now. Um, we even played Washington in the league. So that shows you how different the landscape is of college basketball. Now, Virginia played Washington in the uh, Randolph Bacon. John Hopkins. You, pardon me? John yeah, Hopkins. Yeah, John Hopkins. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you imagine if, if those teams were, I mean, we read of doing James Madison University now because they play Eastern many months. Well, Virginia would play two or three of the schools every year, and it wasn't, it wasn't even thought of as absurd. Yeah. Um, so the social media aspect, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't 
what it was today. You were, you knew you were observing some actual uh, people standing outside. There wasn't such a thing like as stuff uh, for people to go buy their things uh, on the secondary market for outrageous prices. There were scalpers uh, on the street getting ridiculous prices for games against Delaware or uh, Oregon State or University of Baltimore. We're going in watch the game. I think we're losing Scott again. Scott, if you can hear me. Uh, Scott, up uh, for our listeners out there. Scott's actually in transit right now when we're talking. So, uh, this. Oh, there you go. He's back. All right. Uh, Chris? Yeah, no, you're back. You're... Uh, on a personal note, for me, it was pure hell. <laughs> it was a ride to the rich story because at the time I was working uh, in the sports department with Denise Dickens and Jim Gordon was the soul of. Uh, Late sports editor with Tolan, because Tolan was to his, to his trigger. And I would go to a game on Tuesday night with a media pass and walk in and have the best seat in the house. And then on Saturday with no ticket in hand, I'd be out with, with the with the spot. <laughs> Folks, thank you for so it was pure agony for me. I'd either go from the bed out to the outhouse because just because you were a media member, you didn't have a pass. You weren't getting in the door. Although I did find a way or two, if you well know me, to, to maybe uh, get a, find a door that might be inadvertently left open. But seemingly like you were out there with everyone else trying to buy a ticket uh, to get into the game. Um, and it was just a... It was a circus atmosphere around Ralph. That's all. That's the best, best way I can describe it. Rock star, a rock star. I'll say, for from researching for the book, we talked to, among others to Monk Bingler, the the, the uh, bless his soul too. He passed away, um, but he had been there for eighty one years. And and, and, t- and talking with him and some other ushers when we were doing research for the book, that Ralph's last home game. Uh, which uh, we included, and in fact, I, I found the entire game on YouTube. I, I, I posted it with the uh, column we wrote. I, I wrote a column about the seven most memorable games at University Hall, and that was certainly one of them. Ralph's final home game, March 6, 1983. And if you want to watch the whole game, you can actually watch it. You go to that. Go to our website, Augusta Free Press, and you can actually there's the, the YouTube is embedded into that story. And uh, I, I can't tell you I watched the whole game, but I did watch a good portion of that game when I was writing this column yesterday. Uh, after I wrote the column yesterday and posted it, uh, and uh, so Monk was telling me about how the ushers, uh, you know, male and female, the, uh, the male ushers wore tuxedos, the, the women wore evening gowns. They treated it as what it was. It was Ralph's last home game. Uh, it was the end of an era, and they wanted to treat the moment with the appropriate uh, sense of, of how heavy that moment was, and so so they treated it that way. And it's just so neat to think that you know that was the case and. I guess I thought I'd share some thoughts too. You know, I, I was a student in the early 1990s at UVA, and so Scott kind of told you about the process of both being a, a writer sitting on press row, the best seat in the house, being a fan sitting sometimes at the top of the stadium. Uh, as a student in the 1990s, we weren't the Ralph, it wasn't the Ralph era, but the, I guess there was one in, one NIT champion, uh, and then and then uh, three NCAA tournament appearances for the teams when I was a student there in the in the 90s, and. Um, you know, one year, I think it was my fourth year, uh, UVA started something like 11-0 and or 12-0, and got in the top 10 of the country. Uh, you know, we actually had to camp out for tickets, which was interesting that year. Uh, I remember uh, my, my college roommate, Jay Whitaker, uh, and I uh, would take turns. Uh, which not only would you have to camp out to get tickets, but then you had to get there early to get in line uh, to get the really good seats behind either basket uh uh, you wanted to sit as low as possible, obviously, if you were that kind of way. So uh, we would take turns being the person to kind of hold the spot in, our, spot in line, uh, take books to read, take projects you're working on, whatever the case. Uh, I remember there was one UVA Carolina game that – the UVA Carolina game that year. Uh, boy, I had – I never worked harder in my life. I actually Jay, – Jay had an exam that, that was a weeknight, like a Tuesday or Wednesday night, and I had to – not only hold a spot in line, but his exam actually pushed into 
the you could you could get in two hours early, I guess, uh, and, uh, and and sit wait for the game to start for two hours. Uh, and he, he, I think the game was an eight o'clock start. He couldn't get there till about seven thirty, seven forty-five. So not only did I have to hold our spot in line for hours, but then had to hold his seat lower level, right behind the basket, for a couple hours. Stare off everybody who wanted to take it. Like I had to look as menacing as I could, and I can look menacing, I guess. So, uh, but some good and, and UVA won that game. I remember they won the game either in late in regulation or maybe overtime. I'd have to go look at the records, but because I'm just thinking about this now. But it was one of those games where you were glad that you know you you had gone through all that to have that enjoyment of of, of, of basketball, and and so uh, you know those were some great years. Uh, you know, it tailed off at the end, you know, after Jeff Jones, uh, his program, tr- you know, kind of trailed off the Pete Gillen era. And then they hired Dave Lato and, you know, that kind of thing. You know, the last few years of U-Haul weren't what U-Haul deserved. I, can, can I put it that way, Scott? U-Haul deserved better than those last, say, 10 years that it hosted basketball games. I, it, it wasn't the same as it was for those heyday years, that 15-year period from the first year of Ralph through like 95 those were some damn good years in basketball those last 10 years that was a horrible way to send off you all scotty still there i think i've lost scott his the phone says he's still here but i think i may have lost scott from that standpoint let me see scott can you hear me all right, let me – I'll keep talking while uh, I'm trying to get Scott back on here. I just was watching a Jim, Jim Rome show, and they lost uh, Brad Keselowski, so it happens. Um, they played music uh, and talked and had some fun with it in between. And I, I mentioned Scott is in transit, so if, if I have to finish this one – we had some contributions from Scott. If I have to finish this one without Scott, that'll be – yeah, looks like I've lost him. So um, – so I'll, I'll, you know, so yeah, those years, you all deserved a better send off than it got. It didn't get it. Um, oh, here's Scott's calling back then. Let's see here. Hey, Scott, do we have you back? Yeah, I'm sorry. Chris, um, I'm traveling today. Uh, they weren't a very good defensive team under Pete Gillen. They were more running guns. So yeah, they weren't the, the typical UVA teams that we saw under Terry and then initially under, uh, under, under Jeff Jones. So, um, boy, Tony Bennett would have been a great coach in New Hall, wouldn't he? <laughs> That's a good. You know, I had never thought about that, but you know, the the glory years of Terry Holland, the first five years of Jeff Jones were some pretty good years. Those UVA teams had carried with them what the Tony Bennett teams do now too. Now they they didn't play the pack line defense, but you knew when you played Terry Holland teams and Jeff Jones teams, you were going to get. You were going to have a hard time scoring in the lane. Uh, you know, you might get beat up a little bit. Uh, Dean Smith used to whine all the time. Terry Holland used to talk about what what was the, the line that uh, something about he named his dog Dean because his dog whined all the time. Uh, yeah, Tony would have fit in. Tony's teams would have fit in well uh, in Utah. He would have, he would have loved he would have loved coaching there as a throwback coach like he was. And his teams really fit his, his teams really fit that that mentality really well. I agree. So, um, just alluding back to a question you asked me about the, some of the experiences about you all, and just kind of give you an analogy. Things like this would not happen today. I got to, you know, not only when I was had the privilege of being a media covering the game, even after the game, you could walk around, you could go, you could easily go in behind the curtain, so to speak, and get into the inner side. Um, and I would talk to a lot of the ushers. Got to meet, talk to a lot of the fish. Got to know them personally. Um, some great um, college basketball officials that I'm sure old timer UVA fans will, will remember the name. Buddy Works, uh, Dick McCarr. Um, I remember one night talking to Dick, and it was after a particularly tough game. And, and Virginia had won, but. Uh, there was some controversial calls that Dick had made. We were standing there, but ready to leave. And he asked me and a friend that were standing there, hey, would you guys walk up to my car with me? I'm not too sure 
insane. Um, so we escorted Dick Papar to his car. <laughs> now, can you imagine if that's the thing happened today? The, the officials are given a police escort, yeah. not only to their car, but as they to get out of town, to get to the airport, they're given a police escort. Uh, so things like that just could never happen today. If you were so, you had so much access to the players. Uh, I used to give uh, 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 Anthony Solomon. He played on him after the game. He did the ride home. He was gone. Uh, he was uh, You know, those kinds of things now. And I became good friends with him. He still is. Followed his career. Followed, followed his post college career. Uh, and just he goes to the head coach and Big body is such a difficult thing. Uh, currently, in, in first state. Um, so I made a lot of friends. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a different age, and, and I had that flip, flip in that era. Yeah, Scott's breaking up a little bit, but I'll, uh, he can probably still hear me. I thought we we'll talk about stories after games and such. Two come to mind: the uh, Richard Morgan 39-point game they beat Carolina 106-83 back in '89, included in my seven most memorable games. Uh, after that game, Dean Smith gets a speeding ticket driving home. He he drove home in a huff, got a speeding ticket in Amherst County, which of course uh, you, you find uh, well, that was that was in January of that year, and at the ACC tournament that year, people were handing out copies of that speeding ticket uh, just, just, just to rattle Dean Smith. Uh, there was a when I was a student at UVA, 1990-1991, uh, Duke lost a game, a, a Duke team that would go on that year to win the first of two national championships in a row. Uh, Duke lost a game. Uh, this was uh, what Christian Leitner, Bobby Hurley, Grant Hill uh, team. Got blown out on a Saturday afternoon by UVA, 81-64. I'll never forget that game uh, because as a student, I, I li- I'm living in Waynesboro. You know, being a native of Waynesboro, it was a Christmas break game. That year, Duke and UNC were both Christmas break games. So I, it was not hard for me to get student tickets to those games because they were over Christmas break. So I just it was, it was awesome to be able to do that. But, yeah, 81-64, Saturday afternoon. Coach K puts his team on the bus. They get off the bus in Durham. He practices them. You can't do that anymore now. You can't practice the day after after the day of a game. Basically, he put him he put him on the bus or got him off the bus, made him practice as punishment. Uh, it worked. They won the national championship that year. But um, that so so Dean Smith and a huff, Coach K and a huff. Those are good things. If you, if you can you know piss off Dean Smith and Coach K, those are those are good days. Uh, and tell me this story then, okay? I mean, Lefty was notorious for just stomping his feet on the floor oh, and yeah, yeah. his face turning red, red as a tomato. Uh, Lefty was Lefty had to be up there. And Gary Williams, I mean, let, just to think the legendary coach that came through that door, Lefty Dudell, Gary Williams, Dean Smith, Mike Chef, Jim Valvano. Yeah. The, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Jim Calhoun brought a good team into the U-Haul. Uh, late in his career, or uh, uh, late in the life of you all, I think it was a couple years before they moved across the street. Hey, DJ. Gino Oriema would be another one that people don't even remember this time. A lot of folks don't remember the time that Gino Oriema was on Debbie Ryan's staff as an assistant coach before he went on to be the UConn coach and be the guy that he is now leading, you know, winning all those championships at UConn. Yeah, and we, uh, we haven't even talked about women's basketball and we talk about Ralph Sampson being one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. Don Daly has to be included in that argument on the women's side, for sure. Oh, yeah, three straight Final Fours. Uh, her and the Birds twins and, and Dina Evans. And I'm trying to think of all those players. I played I played pickup basketball with a lot of the women's players. They they would, uh, in, in, before the season in October and after their season in, in, in March and April, uh, they would seek out, uh, and play, you know, they wanted to play competitive pickup ball with with males uh, who were good players. But you know, so I, I was, I guess, good enough to play with the, with the women's players, and and very fortunate to be able to play a lot of pickup games with these ladies. And they were good, and they were aggressive, and they were assertive, and they they would tell you shit if they wanted to tell you shit. You know, I mean, they talk talk crap with anybody, and and uh, yeah, they, I, I remember there was a game. Uh, 
I think UVA was ranked one and Maryland was ranked two or vice versa. They played in U-Haul. I sat – the only time in my life I ever sat on the final, the back row, the top row of U-Haul. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually sitting right behind the basket for men's games, but – uh, there, there was such demand for this number one versus number two matchup that the place was absolutely packed, and um, it was as loud as I've ever heard anything in my life, probably even since. You, you know, it, it certainly compared to JPJ level of loudness for this one versus two game. And uh, I, when we did the book, I interviewed Dina Evans, who I play a lot of pickup basketball with uh, back in the day, and I asked her about that game and I, her thoughts and memories of that game. And she said the one memory she had was. She turned to Don Staley late in that game. Like they, they're coming out of a TV timeout, like the three minutes to go, uh, you know, right before the uh, at, at the end of the game. And she, she, they were talking to each other and couldn't hear each other. And so uh, she said she screamed at the top of her lungs and still couldn't even hear herself. It was so loud in there. And uh, for women's basketball, so yeah, we, yeah. The, the women's team, those those Debbie Ryan teams from the late '80s all the way through the early 2000s. The men's team had a drop off. The women's team never really had that drop off until literally the last couple of years of Debbie's era, and we certainly haven't gotten that back since. But there was a long period of time where women's basketball that that was one of the the the, the, the key venues in women's basketball was University Hall. The largest, and this is the state that the game will go to will live in infamy. Well, well, I don't want to use that word. This game will forever be remembered by you all fans. This is the Highest attended game ever was a women's game, yeah. and it was this one dollar hot dog night that they crammed eleven thousand people, in, and I was one of them. Uh, buy a hot dog for a dollar, eleven thousand people in the building, and the fire marshal found out about it. Yeah, we're losing losing you there again, Scott. Yeah, it was hot dog night. We call it. We wrote a oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. After that game, they had to drop the attendance to official capacity down to below 9,000 because they said you could no longer block aisles, you could no longer switch in and put too many people on the on a, on a bench seat. And uh, so the women hold the record for the highest attended game that you all is. Yeah, the official announced attendance. I got this because we uh, this was one of my most memorable games in the column, and of course we wrote a whole chapter about this game in the book. The official announced attendance was 11,174. Uh, the the after that game after the fire marshal weighed in the the uh, the official rated attendance uh, attendance was eighty three ninety two so yeah they cramped three thousand more people in for people who went later years to U Haul and even those who went early years and forgot you know we, the the in later years that they had replaced those bench seats in the upper deck with with seats with you know traditional seats. But back in the old days, if you want to call them the old days, yeah, they had they had they had the, the more the more general mission type seating up there, so you could you could fit butts in the seats. But uh, Terry Holland had a great quote when I interviewed him for the you know among the things we interviewed about in the book, uh, he was of course still a men's coach at that time, and then of course becomes the AD you know years later. He says, "Here's the quote: Promotion was a huge success. We set a women's record at that time for attendance, but it cost us about 1,800 seats." a game for future years. He said, that means we gave away free hot dogs and free admission to that game to lose 1,800 seats times at least 300 games since and an average of $20 per game. That's well over $10 million in lost revenue. That's a great promotion. <laughs> that's what it's put in perspective. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I was there that night, and I was there, you know, for all the route here. But I don't know how anyone breathed and 11,000 people were able to even catch a breath of oxygen that night. I could not imagine. It, it felt like you were in a, in a 10 Jan when there was 8,500 people in there. 11,000, I don't know how we all survived. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, and, and the, the, you know, so that it says a lot about the women's game, though. That was a number three UVA versus number 15 Carolina game that year. And so the women's team certainly, uh, had had some great great years, many great years in in, in University Hall and and um, so I would I would say you know click on the article I, I, I included a lot of detail about these games too that I picked out seven games that we highlighted in great detail in our book and I kind of you know winnowed down some of the because the book was 250 pages and 
winded it down to about 4,000 words. It's still a long article to read. But also, I included YouTube clips from each game. And in the one case, the uh, Ralph Sampson Maryland game, his his final home game. That's the entire game. It's rare to find an entire game like that, but I did find the, it was the entire game broadcast. But clips from all the others, uh, including the last ball in U-Haul. Now, the last ball in U-Haul clip, the only thing I could find was actually the, the post-game sort of ceremonies. UVA lost that game. Uh, uh, down one, lost the game, missed a shot at the end. They could have won the game. Uh, maybe a sort of fitting ending, I guess you can say, for, for that long era of, of U-Haul basketball that uh, – it just it surprises me even now, Scott. You were at that that Ralph game against Maryland, his final home game. You know, I, I I can only imagine what it was like there. I, I remember I was watching on TV. I was 11 years old, and I was already at that point hooked as a UVA basketball fan, UVA sports fan. Uh, if you'd have told me that at age 47 I would still be as addicted as I was then, I would have said, "Yep, I, I'm pretty sure I would have been." But Ralph missing those two free throws, getting the rebound, making the shot. Uh, Seemed appropriate then, and boy, in the context of what we've seen now. So I'll bring it all the way back to where we are now in UVA basketball. Uh, you know, the the run we had that ended a few weeks ago with some some pretty stirring victories, close games, etc. We had a lot of those in the U haul days as well. Uh, we didn't always win them like we did this past March and early April, but uh, you know, I guess as we sum things up here on our podcast. Uh, you know, as as we count down the final hours of University Hall, uh, I'd say on the whole, lots and lots of good memories. A lot, and I'm, I'm fortunate to be one of the members of the media that's going to be there tomorrow. I hear that they've really got security tightened around U Hall, where they're not going to allow any pedestrian traffic, motor traffic. Um, not quite sure why. Look, obviously safety issues, but. Um, you know, I, I had a discussion with my wife. She said, if it's not safe, then why are the media allowed to go? And I said, well, you know, maybe because that most of the media that are going to be there probably feel like if they're hit by a chunk of cement and that's the end of their life, then that's the way they were supposed to go. And that's the way I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, yeah. If I die tomorrow because of 500 pound block falls on me, then boy, am I going to have a lot of stories to tell in, in the here out. And you and and I and I won't give this one away. Uh, I'll make people buy the book. Uh, but Scott tells a really uh, good story in our book, Team of Destiny, uh, about where he parked. Uh, because Scott wasn't able to, to go to Minneapolis with the rest of us uh, because he had uh, he was really sick and, and, and but but you know you were able to so, sort of soldier yourself through you watched the game at JPJ on the big screen with lots of fans and and you were able to park at U-Haul and you kind of describe an emotional moment uh, that kind of hit you uh, as you were walking back to your car after all those celebrations. And I'll let I'll make people buy the book to kind of live that with you, but uh, I, I, but I thought. Yeah, buy the book. Buy the book. Hey, you better buy it soon. I, mean, I guess I can wrap up with this too. I mean, we're nostalgic uh, about New U Hall, and I'm still nostalgic. I, I'm not even sure if nostalgia describes where I am with this championship. It's been a month and a half, and I'm still acting like it happened like five minutes ago. But uh, the uh, uh, book's selling well uh, to a point where you know I'll, I'll give some inside numbers. I don't care. Uh, you know, we're printing this ourselves. We're, we're, you know, we don't have a big company behind us. The company is us. It's Jerry and I, and you know, our, our, our mutual forces aligned here. So, uh, we, we ordered a thousand books and hope we would sell them. <laughs> you know, that's not a guarantee. When you order a thousand, you'll sell them. They're, they're due in in, a, in about a week. Uh, those thousand have already been accounted for and more. We in fact had to up the order uh, significantly. And uh, where what we up the order to is almost out now too. So, uh, so if you are listening to this podcast, you've ordered the book. It is going to be on its way soon. Uh, the people who put it in the envelope will be me, my wife, Scott, Jerry, Scott Radcliffe, some combination of all of us. Our hands will be in there, uh, putting those in the envelopes for you, getting the mail slips to you, and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, we're very fortunate that it's selling. I mean, the photography in this book by John Markham and some other folks, uh, 
Yeah, John Golden as well. Yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, so John um, is it Golden. Golden. Uh, yeah, Golden. Yeah, yeah. So oh. it was a nationally renowned photographer. Uh, uh, just, just amazing color photos. Novel. Yeah, so it's it's selling well. Uh, the the first run was pretty. It's, it's all accounted for. We'll get those out soon. But uh, we're very fortunate. We have a book signing event coming up. Uh, our book launch, the official book launch, is is already scheduled for June twenty second, a Saturday night, downtown mall at the New Dominion Bookstore, uh, and they're going to be hosting our launch party. Jerry and I will be there. Scott and Scott will be there. Maybe uh, maybe Zach will be able to be with us too. He's he's starting a job soon with ESPN actually, uh, but we'll hopefully have Zach uh, in town for that Saturday night. Uh, we'll see if we can scrounge up some some special celebrity guests to join us. Uh, but it should be a great night on the downtown mall to launch the book formally June 22nd. We have information on our website about that. Uh, looking forward to, you know, just getting out there and, and signing some books. I mean, well, you know, if you want my scribble, you want Jerry, you probably want Jerry's more than mine, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll scribble it. We'll, we'll put our name in a book, uh, for you. Uh, and, uh, that's a great place to pick one up if you haven't already ordered it or if, you know, the orders are, are kind of backlogged. Uh, but that's coming up and, um, uh, and, and looking forward to getting that out too. So nostalgia about that, nostalgia about you haul And Scott will be on scene tomorrow for, as, as we're recording this podcast, is tomorrow. Uh, for, for and he'll be covering that for uh, for Augusta Free Press. I'm sure we'll see some photos and, and, and a story from Scott coming from that this weekend as well. So, uh, final thoughts, Scott. I got an email from uh, Jim Dave, who's the sports information guru at UBA, warning the the, the media for that it's going to be hot uh, to wear appropriate clothing. Uh, it, it's almost uh, that we're going to have to walk back to the shuttle back. It's almost like he got discouraged. He could tell me there were going to be wild lions let loose, uh, you know, turn loose and take clock their field, which is the viewing uh, platform for the boys. And it would not say that I'd be there. Yeah, and see me, I'm the I'm the person who who kind of shies away from even going to funerals. So uh, I've 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 paid my last respects to University Hall, and I'm not even sure if I'll watch it on Facebook. I'll uh, I've uh, I want to remember U Hall. You know, I guess I, I'm sure the last time I was in U Hall, Scott, because you may have been in the uh, uh, in the inside the door since. I bet the last time I was inside U Hall was. Was for that last game in in 2006. I bet I, I don't I, I I can't think of a reason I would have been in since then, but I want to remember it that way. Well, and, and uh, that's completely understandable. That you had a you had a good close. Uh, I was in the building as well. And I think I was in the building in November. So I worked part time with the university, and I had to go in to do payroll stuff. And the building was. Not what you would want to think. It was really, they were in the final few weeks having any officers there, and they weren't, you could tell they weren't maintaining it at all. And I wanted to get in and get out as quickly as possible. But it wasn't what I was used to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Scott will have coverage of that for us this weekend. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, we want, we want to, we want to bid adieu to a, a, Building a venue that uh, had a lot of held a lot of good memories for a lot of us, and so thank you, listeners, for joining us here on this podcast as we shared our thoughts. And thank you, Scott. And uh, I guess I'll sign off the way I traditionally do these podcasts. Wahoo! Wah.